Good evening. I'm spot on weather meteorologist Matthew Euler. Welcome to tonight's How the Weather Works training series topic. Tonight I'm going to really delve into more on atmospheric circulation. I'll talk a little bit about monsoons, the global circulation, as well as I'll end tonight's training topic on the force of friction. The opening graphic on tonight's training just showing the differences in circulations. I'll talk more about the global circulation here in a moment. But in general, we have three particular cells. It's called the three cell theory when I talk about global circulation. First cell is composed of the Hadley cell, which we have rising air motion, generally at the equator, and sinking air motion at about 30 degrees north latitude. So typically you find lower pressure with the rising air motion, a part of the Hadley cell near the equator, and sinking vertical motion uh, where we have some of the world's deserts, such as the Sahara Desert as an example, is situated generally around 30 degrees north. When air sinks, it warms and dries out. So you really don't get a lot of precipitation at a latitude such as 30 degrees north. Now the feral cell is also known as a mid-latitude cell and it's comprised of this sinking vertical motion at 30 degrees north. The air moves along the surface towards 60 degrees north and it converges with the polar cells, low level circulation, resulting in rising air motion at 60 degrees north latitude. And this is generally associated with another region on Earth that is associated with lower barometric pressure and general storminess. So just want to start things off and talk a little bit about the Hadley cell, and then we talk about the feral or mid-latitude cell, which extends from 30 to 60 degrees north, and then a little bit more, we'll be getting more into this here in a moment, the polar cell from 60 degrees north to the North Pole at 90 degrees north. But in general, this is called the three-cell theory. Again, three cells, the Hadley, the feral, and the polar, and the various vertical motions, whether that be upward at the equator, and upward at 60 degrees north latitude, downward at 90 degrees north latitude, and downward at 30 degrees north latitude. So as far as global circulation goes, let's talk a little bit more about that. Air is definitely more intensely heated near the equator. And when air is intensely heated, the warming that takes place is going to cause an air parcel to be positively buoyant and want to rise. This follows a thermally driven pressure gradient toward the poles. Now, it's all about a balancing act, and I kind of discussed this in the, my previous videos to this point, in that the warmer air from the equator or tropics is trying to balance out the colder air which exists over the polar area. So you get this global circulation that helps to redistribute this heat energy. Some of the air is actually going to cool and lose its buoyancy, and that's that sinking air motion I mentioned on the opening slide at 30 degrees north latitude. That's where you typically have your subtropical high pressure systems in the northern hemisphere, such as the Bermuda Azores high in the Atlantic or the eastern Pacific high. So generally we get subsiding air warm and drying out at 30 degrees latitude. Um, so generally you get fair weather at this location. At the surface, that same air is going, then it heads north and south from 30 degrees latitude. The Coriolis force, by the way, is going to deflect the flow of the global circulation, that wind associated with the global circulation, to the right of its intended path in the northern hemisphere. Overall, this deflection of the Coriolis force results in a prevailing westerly wind belt between 30 and 60 degrees north latitude a northeasterly trade wind belt in the northern hemisphere between the equator and 30 degrees north latitude. At the poles themselves, cold air is also going to sink or subside, but it's very cold and it's very dense. Once that air reaches the surface at 90 degrees north or at that north pole area in our example, that wind is going to blow back along the Earth's surface towards the equator. And again, the air, the Coriolis force is going to deflect this wind flow or the airflow 
producing a belt of winds from 60 to 90 degrees north, known as the polar easterly wind belt. Now where the low level convergence occurs between the polar easterlies and those prevailing westerlies, that's going to result in an area of storminess, lifting air motion, clouds and precipitation, and the polar front around 60 degrees latitude. Now all of these belts of circulation are generally going to move southward and northward along with the annual journey of the sun. The sun generally travels year round between 23.5 degrees south latitude at the Tropic of Capricorn, travels north to 23.5 degrees latitude there, north latitude at the Tropic of Cancer. So the sun is always the most direct rays of the sun kind of shift throughout the course of the year from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer. Here's a look in general of the global circulation. I started today's training by talking about the three cell theory. And let me go ahead and get my drawing tool so we can kind of point some things out here. All right, so I got my little laser pointer here. So generally, here's a schematic that shows the global circulation, the wind belts across the world. Uh, generally here at the equator at zero degrees latitude, we have areas of low pressure that tend to occur and this is an area of thunderstorms. Showers and thunderstorms are typical at this location. And the winds are very light at the equator. Um, in fact, I've been on a ship before that actually crossed the equator and the winds are extremely light. The air is very muggy. Um, in general, you see puffy cumulus clouds around this belt of rising air motion. And again, it's just very, very muggy. The wind's very light. That's why they call this area, because of the light winds, they call the equatorial area the doldrums. Now, air is going to rise. Over here on the left, you'll notice the arrows. You'll notice when the arrow's pointing up, that means the air is rising, cooling, condensing, and forming clouds, and in some cases, precipitation. Um, so in general, at the equator, the sun is out. It's very strong, the solar radiation is intense, the air is heated, it is positively buoyant as I mentioned, the air rises, and it rises to the upper portions of the troposphere, and then it spreads out as indicative uh, by these blue arrows here, and once the air reaches about 30 degrees north latitude, and also 30 degrees south latitude if you live in the southern hemisphere, the air is going to sink, there's going to be downward motion of the air. And that is going to result in a high pressure in a, a fair area of the globe around 30 degrees north and south latitude. That's associated with these subtropical high pressure systems. And this area is known as the horse latitudes at about 30 degrees latitude in the northern hemisphere. This is the horse latitudes. So now once the air sinks at 30 degrees north latitude, it warms, it dries out, associated with high pressure and fair weather. Some of the air then moves back towards the equator along the Earth's surface. Now, as this air moves from north, from the subtropical high, from the north to the south, to the equatorial low, air always blows from high to low pressure. Um, you're going to have a counterclockwise spinning of the Earth. And this wind is going to be deflected to the right of its intended path. It starts off going north-south, but because of the rotation of the Earth, that wind is deflected to the right of its intended path of motion, resulting in these northeasterly trade winds in the northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, that same wind is going, Coriolis force is going to act to the left of its intended path of motion of the wind, and it's going to result in these southeasterly trade winds. Okay? Now, from, from 30 degrees north latitude, I'm going to move back to the northern hemisphere and kind of make this discussion a little more simplistic. Air sinks, some of it goes towards the equator. I talked about this um, wind belt here with the northeast trades. Some of the air also flows back along the surface towards 60 degrees latitude. And as it's moving from south to north at the surface, again, the earth is turning and rotating beneath this air and it's resulting in a deflection to the right of its intended path of motion, the airstream. And that results in these prevailing westerly wind belts. Generally, in both hemispheres, whether we talk northern or southern, uh, they're generally westerly wind belts from 30 degrees latitude to 60 degrees latitude in both 
hemispheres. We're familiar with this area because most of the United States, a good chunk of Europe, is located within the mid-latitude westerly wind belt. So weather tends to move from west to east because of this circulation. And then at 60 degrees north, the air begins to rise once more. And what happens? As air rises, it cools, condenses, forms clouds and precipitation. And this is the location of the subpolar low or the polar front at 60 degrees north of latitude because we have converging air from the polar easterlies meeting the um, southwesterlies or the westerly wind belt at 30 degrees latitude. You generally have low pressure systems located in areas of storminess at that latitude. Now, as some of the air rises, it moves towards the poles, and some of the air moves in the upper levels of the atmosphere back to 30 degrees latitude. But in general, in this particular area, or from 60 degrees north and 90 degrees north, you generally have these polar easterly winds. Um, again, due to the turning of the Coriolis force, uh, the winds trying to blow from north to south in this particular wind belt, 60 to 90 degrees north, but because of the twisting, rotating motion of the earth beneath it, Coriolis forced to flex the airflow to the right and results in a predominantly easterly wind flow. If you're anywhere north of 60 degrees latitude, you're going to experience a primarily easterly wind flow. And then again, here is the description of the cells, the three cell theory. This is the Hadley cell, 0 to 30 degrees latitude. This is the feral or mid-latitude cell, 30 to 60 degrees latitude. And then you have the polar cell, 60 to 90 degrees latitude. All right, so as far as the global circulation goes, the circulation patterns are also affected by land masses, um, terrain, uneven distribution of temperature occurs as a result. So we have these predominant pressure systems that influence the general wind patterns for this global circulation here. And the reason we have, for example, let's say, I'll just use the subtropical highs as an example, the reason we don't have one big continuous subtropical high at 30 degrees latitude is because the air is going to flow, the trajectory of the air is going to move across these areas of higher terrain, um, as well as, in addition to the higher terrain, you have this land mass here, the United States, North America, and that tends to break up these circulation cells on the global scale. So you get one area of high pressure over the eastern Pacific and another area of high pressure over the Atlantic. So these the prevailing wind belts here, the global circulation, are actually broken up by uneven terrain, these higher mountainous areas, as well as the fact that we have these land masses. Um, the U.S., for example, sits between the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. So we get two discrete, uh, two discrete circulations of high pressure. Additionally, we have uneven heating between land and water. There's different specific heats. Land heats up much more quickly and cools off much more quickly than water. Uh, different source regions also encourage pooling of large air masses above them. Um, air, uh, source regions are the areas which air masses originate. Um, generally favorable conditions include areas of light wind in source regions. Um, and very flat terrain generally promotes some sort of air mass source region. These different source regions impart distinct temperature and moisture characteristics to these air masses overlying them, distorting the flow into curved wave-like motions. Now getting back to terrain, before I advance the slide, I wanted to show you a terrain map here in the bottom right portion of this slide. Any of these areas in yellow generally indicate mountainous areas. I'm just kind of showing you across the world where we have higher elevation areas or mountains. Of course, a lot of uh, Asia, Siberia, Tibetan, uh, Tibetan Plateau, for example. Um, in Europe, we have some higher elevation associated with the Alps. Uh, we have the Pyrenees. Uh, we also have some higher terrain in Iran, as well as along the west coast of South America. Um, due to active tectonic plates, we generally have higher elevation along the west coast of South America. We have some higher elevation in eastern Africa. Anywhere in the yellow, lighter yellow shading here, and the browns indicate higher elevation or terrain. So you can see, you know, in the middle latitude westerly belt, you have a lot of higher mountainous areas and higher terrain that tend to really deflect this global circulation. I just wanted to really point that out. 
All right, so now let's take a closer look at the, at the specific heat of land versus water. Water generally tends to have a higher heat capacity. It can store a lot more heat. It's, much, it's a much more denser substance water is as compared to land. And so with water having a higher heat capacity as compared to land, it tends to gain and lose heat much more slowly. And you may have noticed this before, for example, in the um, hurricane season when you see some of the warmest water temperatures occurring into August, September, kind of like into the early fall, you get some of the warmest water temperatures to really help fuel hurricanes and tropical systems. It's because the water tends to cool off much more slowly, let's say, than a nearby landmass. Same thing in the wintertime. Some of the coldest sea surface temperatures actually occur in early February, late January, early February, well beyond the winter solstice in late December because, again, those waters tend to warm much more slowly. So in general, you have the sun out in this picture here that I'm showing, the rays of the sun, the heat, incoming solar radiation, heating the land versus the water, and you generally get lower specific heat. In other words, it takes less heat to heat this land mass. If I had the same amount of heat coming from the sun, the radiation, this land mass, it would take lower specific heat to heat it as compared to this water. In addition, on the water side, if you take a look at this, this arrow, generally shows you the circulation patterns in the ocean. Like I said, it's a very dense substance. Some of that heat energy is used to absorb the top layer of the water surface. Um, you don't really have that with land masses. Obviously, there's no water there. In this particular image of just a regular land mass next to a water body. And so evaporation tends to be, you know, taking up a lot of the heat energy. A lot of the moisture is evaporated from the ocean surface instead of being directly heating, instead of directly heating this ocean surface. Let's now move on to discussion about something known as monsoons. Now this is a global circulation type of wind and these monsoonal winds result from seasonal changes in temperature and pressure. It goes back to this difference in heating between land and water. This really is a big driver in developing the monsoon seasons. It causes a significant shift in the prevailing wind overall, and I'll show you an example of that here in a moment. Now, during the summertime, the land areas are going to heat up much more quickly than the neighboring water areas. Land also cools more quickly during the winter season. Corresponding air columns over these two areas exhibit the same temperature properties or thermal properties as the source areas beneath them. So in summer, the air column over land tends to be warmer. So you notice the thickness of an air column is really directly proportional to the underlying surface. So if I have a really good um, high effective heat, uh, lower heat capacity of land and it gets hotter, it's going to cause a much taller air column over that heated land as compared to Let's say a air column over the water is going to be much more shallow or shorter because um, the water tends to moderate the heating. It's, it's not as drastic. So we get a colder or shorter air column over land during the winter because we have the coldest temperatures usually reside over land. And then we get a taller column over water in winter because the moderating impact of a slightly warmer surface um, there of the water. So temperature gradient or changes, the different heating between water and land tend to drive these pressure gradient or differences, this pressure gradient force, which drives air aloft from higher pressure, the warmer air column, toward lower pressure, the colder air column. So we get a circulation pattern that sets up, and on the surface, air is going to flow from the colder column to the warmer column, producing surface low pressure in areas beneath the warm column, and surface high pressure in areas under the colder column. And Coriolis force, our friend Coriolis force once again, acts on these winds, producing seasonal shifting monsoonal flow. Some of the common monsoonal areas across the world really focus in on the Indian Ocean and the Asian continent. You can get these quasi-monsoonal areas, a smaller scale over the U.S. desert southwest, in July, 
into early August when the landmass of the desert southwest is heated so intensely. Um, but in general, you're going to get the main monsoonal effects into the Indian Ocean and the Asian continent. Let me show you some graphics here. All right, so the summer monsoon circulation pattern is on the left. The winter monsoon circulation pattern is on the right. Now in the summer, you'll notice something here. In the summertime, this landmass heats much more efficiently than the water in the Indian Ocean. Okay? The water in the Indian Ocean heats much more slowly. The land is heating up much more rapidly. So overall, you get low pressure and rising air motion over the heated land. And as the air rises over the heated land, the circulation, the wind generally blows from the southwest from the water toward the land. This air is coming in to replace the off the water is coming in to replace the air that's rising over the heated continent, the heated land area. So in general, this is also known not only as the summer monsoon, but also the southwest monsoon. These red arrows indicate the general prevailing flow. And during this time of year, places of India in India especially get hit with some of the heaviest precipitation totals in the world. You have a little bit of elevated terrain. And when this wind flow, this warm, moist air moves in off the Indian Ocean and hits the higher terrain, the air is forced to rise and it's basically all that moisture is wrung out of the atmosphere and can produce some of the greatest rainfall in the world. Uh, for example, for average rainfalls across the world, Cherrapunji, India is one of, the, one of the locations that generally has the greatest annual rainfall in all of the world, Cherrapunji, India. Now, let's take a look at the graphic on the right. That is an example of the winter monsoon. And with the winter monsoon, we have a difference in pressure patterns. Now, we have area of high pressure over the Asiatic continent. Um, the air mass over the land is much colder as this land mass cools much more efficiently than the nearby water. And generally, air is going to blow from high to low pressure in this case, during the winter monsoon season, you'll notice the red arrows represent the wind flow from the northeast. And so in general, you get much colder air blowing in from the land toward the water. And in general, you get a northeasterly wind flow during the winter monsoon times of year. So, and, and a lot of people refer to winter monsoon as a northeast monsoon, as the air blows from the Asi Asiatic continent or Siberian continent, Siberia area towards the Indian Ocean. All right, now I'm going to move into a uh, discussion on thermal lows, or these heat lows. And they occur on a smaller scale. They're over large continental areas, they're particularly the desert areas, where you have intense low-level surface heating. Hot and dry air accumulates in these locations during the summertime. Air parcels to the surface are going to rise adiabatically. You know, the air is going to be very intensely heated over the desert areas. It's going to rise in the vertical and produce these dynamic surface lows. Now thermal lows, and I talked a little bit about warm core lows the last training session, tend to weaken with height. They lack moisture in general. Even though you have rising air motion associated with these heat lows or thermal lows, they lack the moisture due to the underlying dry land. In the bottom right hand picture, I'm showing an example of this red line represents this thermal trough. And generally, in the California especially, you'll notice this thermal trough setting up in the valley. Fresno area, um, San Bernardino, you generally have a inverted trough at this location. And this is associated with intense surface heating, uh, generally over the desert areas of California. Another type of breeze that is on a more local scale is known as a land and sea breeze. Now during the day, the sun's out. This, this again involves the difference in heating between the land and the water. Land heating much more quickly during the daytime, um, cooling off much more quickly at night, creates these pressure differences which, you know, between the land, the heat of land during the day, and the water, the water in general, where we have a difference between high and low pressure systems and the flow of air. During the day, the coastal regions are going to exhibit a temperature distribution with warmer, taller air columns due to diurnal or daily heating over land and colder, shorter air columns over water. 
And this overall sea breeze during the day, where the wind blows in off the water, is going to reverse at night as the land cools much more quickly than the nearby water due to those specific heat differences we talked about. The resulting circulation produces onshore winds during the day from the water to the land and offshore winds during the night from the land back out to the water. Now, sea breeze circulations are important. They can result in daily thunderstorms each afternoon uh, along a sea breeze front during the summertime in the Gulf Coast states, you know, parts of the Florida Panhandle, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, as well as into Florida. A very predominant sea breeze sets up in which we have circulation, wind blowing onshore from both the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico and creates afternoon thunderstorms, especially in areas um, such as Orlando, Florida. Here is a schematic or diagram showing the difference between land and sea breezes. Uh, during the daytime when the sun's out, due to the lower specific heat over, of land, the land the air rises and as, it, as it's heated during the day, represented by this red arrow. At the air in the upper levels tends to move out towards the water and then sink over the water and then this cooler breeze comes in from the water towards the land during the day and that results in a sea breeze. At nighttime, the circulation reverses, which the land is now cooling much more quickly than the nearby water and therefore with the cooler air over land, you have sinking air over land and then the air flows from the land out to the water and this is known as a land breeze at night. Finally, to end tonight's video on the training, I wanted to mention briefly about friction. Um, friction is a very important factor for us here living at the Earth's surface because as the wind blows over the Earth's surface, um, it has to move around buildings, it gets slowed down generally by friction as the wind blows over a solid landmass. Generally, friction results when air in motion is resisted by the Earth's surface features and also by adjacent air molecules. Uh, friction tends to slow the geostrophic as well as the gradient winds and causes the Coriolis force to decrease as wind velocity decreases. So in general, friction is slowing the wind down as it blows across the landscape. Um, and, it, and as a result of that slower wind velocity, your Coriolis force also slows down or is less. Friction will decrease as you go above the Earth's surface as you get away from the effects of the land and you get higher and higher up in the Earth's atmosphere, nothing is slowing the wind speed down when you get to a certain point above the Earth's surface. Planetary boundary layer is a special layer, I abbreviated PBL. This is also known as the friction layer and it usually extends from the surface to about 3,000 feet AGL above ground level, but it can be much, to much higher heights in mountainous terrain. It can extend to much higher heights. And above this PBL or planetary boundary layer, we reach a point where friction is basically non-existent or negligible um, because, again, there's nothing really to slow the wind speed down, um, usually above 3,000 feet when we're in non-mountainous terrain. Here is a couple diagrams to show the differences when we talk about friction. Um, friction can actually act to enhance favored areas of low-level convergence where air comes together. Uh, Here's a good diagram to demonstrate this. So over the sea or over water, you'll notice the length of these arrows, these red arrows in the point here at number one here on the left. The friction is much less over water areas, so you have longer arrows showing a greater magnitude. Uh, as this wind blows onshore, these, this dashed line represents the, the coastal area where the land starts. You'll notice how due to friction, this wind slows down once it gets over the land. And so you have faster moving winds moving towards slower moving winds. And so basically, faster moving into slower moving is gonna result in a convergence or piling up of air, um, which can result in some rising air motion along coastal areas. And think about it, if you're driving and you're going up on a toll, po uh, toll booth at the interstate, um, you know, maybe two miles from the toll booth, you're doing 50 miles per hour, Meanwhile, these folks here are just leaving the toll booth. They're just maybe doing 10 to 15 miles per hour. Eventually, you're going to catch up to these other cars <clears throat> leaving the toll booth, resulting in convergence of cars, an accumulation of more cars in an area. Same thing happens here in the atmosphere. There's a difference in friction between water and land. 
At point two here, I'm going the opposite direction. I'm going uh, with, a, with a wind blowing from the land toward the water, toward the sea. Um, in general, your friction is going to be much less as, as the wind blows out over the water. So slower wind speeds into faster wind speeds leads to a process known as speed divergence, uh, spreading a part of the air here at this point, which would result in you know no particular precipitation at all here. It just shows you a big difference in how friction changes from land to the sea or water. If we're looking at the overall impact of friction on the flow, this top portion of the diagram on the right would indicate um, a geostrophic wind where the pressure gradient force or height gradient force is balanced by Coriolis force, which is abbreviated CF. Uh, generally, the wind blows parallel to these height contours at 700 millibars or 10,000 feet above the ground. Um, so there's really no force of friction here. This is well above the planetary boundary layer that I mentioned in the previous slide. Whereas on the Earth's surface, um, let's say we have an area of surface low pressure, there's surface high pressure, um, air is going to always be directed from high toward low pressure across these isobars, lines of equal pressure. Uh, however, you do have the force of friction, which is going to act completely opposite direction to the winds themselves. So let's say the winds are blowing this direction, represented by the green arrow, um, across the isobars from high to low pressure. There is going to be um, a portion that acts in the opposite direction. That portion is friction, which is going to act to slow the winds and turn them across these lines of equibarometric pressure, these isobars, from high to low pressure. So winds on the surface, due to friction, never blow perfectly per uh, parallel to these isobars, but instead cross them at an angle. All right, that wraps up the training. This is part four, spot on weather, how the weather works training series. So today we covered some global circulation discussion, uh, generally how the global circulation sets up the different um, cells, the three cell theory, the Hadley cell, the polar cell, as well as the mid-latitude feral cell. Uh, we talked about the impacts of rising air motion and sinking air motion. Um, as far as the global circulation goes and how the turning of the wind occurs due to the Coriolis force, setting up these various pressure belts of wind uh, around the globe. We also talked about how these circulation patterns, the global circulation, can be impacted by these elevation differences over land, the terrain, um, and additionally to the land masses themselves, kind of separating the oceans. And then we talked about the differences in specific heat between land versus water, covered a much larger scale circulation due to the difference of heating between land and water. That is known as monsoons, which typically occur uh, over Indian Ocean area and Asian continent. And the various circulations, how they reverse summer on the left, winter on the right. And then a smaller scale circulation, uh, difference between the heating of land versus water is what's known as a thermal or heat low. We talked about land and sea breezes. And then we talked about the impact of friction and how it slows the wind velocity. All right, thank you so much for watching the video tonight. I greatly appreciate, again, the subscription to the Spot on Weather YouTube channel. Um, thank you again so much. I hope you're getting a lot out of this How the Weather Works training series. This is part four. Many more training um, sessions to follow as we work our way through the month of May and into the summer months. All right, again, my name is meteorologist Matthew Euler. Take care, everybody. Until the next training session, um, we'll see you, and take care, and God bless.